And this topic is how to teach uh, 21st century skills. But before I really get into the heart of this topic, I want to get warmed up uh, with a question. I want to answer this question and it's, are you creative? Uh, there's a very famous uh, test that I want to do now to answer this question. I do this with my students. It's very, very popular uh, with my students. So if you remember in the email for this workshop, um, you were asked to bring a blank piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. Uh, so that's what you'll need to take out now. So what I want you to do on the piece of paper in front of you, or a, a notepad, could be a notepad, is I want you to draw two squares like this, two blank squares. Uh, now, don't worry, they don't have to be perfect squares. I don't expect anybody to be Michelangelo drawing perfect squares. Um, but if you just draw two squares uh, on the paper, let me give you 30 seconds uh, to do that, and then we'll continue. So on the piece of paper, draw two empty squares. Uh, the next step, inside the squares, I want you to draw a couple of shapes. Uh, so the first shape you will see on the left-hand side looks like this, and on the right-hand side looks like this. Uh, again, they don't have to be exact, uh, very difficult to draw exact, but as long as they look roughly similar to what you see, uh, that is fine. So draw those two shapes in the squares. Again, let me give you 30 seconds. And now let me tell you what I want you to do. This is the only instruction uh, that I can give you. Uh, I want you to finish the drawings. These drawings are not finished. Uh, your task now is to finish these drawings. And uh, I will give you the time that I give my students. The time is 100 seconds. Actually, it's three minutes. It's a slow countdown. So now complete the drawings, finish the drawings. I will give you three minutes starting now. And stop drawing. There we go. So your drawing should be finished. Uh, what we need to do now, though, art needs an audience. Uh, so what I'm going to do, just as I would with my students, both um, in a face-to-face -face class, and I've done this recently on Zoom, uh, I'm going to put you in a breakout room. Uh, let me see. I can, let's say, three or four people. Uh, I want you to uh, present your drawings to the people in your breakout room on the camera. Uh, so explain what is going on in the drawings that you just finished. And um, if the other people in the group can also ask questions about the drawings, that would be very useful. So if somebody drew a person, who is that person? What is their name? Where are they from? If it's an animal, where is this animal? How old is this animal? How many people are in this uh, animal's family? That kind of thing. Uh, so ask these kinds of questions. Uh, to really see uh, how much people can tell you about their drawings. So now uh, I will give you five minutes in the breakout room. Uh, please discuss your drawings. Here we go. And welcome back. I think everybody is back. So now I think we need to talk about this to see if you were creative. Uh, but first, I just want to quickly tell you what this test is and who it was designed by. Uh, so as we look here. Oh, first I should tell you about my students. Uh, when I did this in Zoom, maybe similar to what you saw in your breakout rooms, uh, they were presenting and they really enjoyed it. Um, if you do this with your own students, um, you can also give an extension to this activity, uh, which is underneath each picture, you ask students to write the story of what's happening in the picture. That can be an extra dimension. So maybe a leaf, a kite, or an envelope. Uh, this test was actually designed by this person, Ellis Paul Torrance, an American psychologist, uh, very popular in terms of creative thinking. And these tests, this is just a small sample of it, uh, are called the Torrance Tests of Creative Thinking. Uh, what I think is interesting, he actually came up with some categories to measure people's creativity, and he thought he could do that with these tests. Uh, so let's take a look at the first category. Uh, to measure people's creativity, he said fluency. So as English teachers, we usually think of fluency in terms of speaking, but how about fluency in terms of ideas? Uh, how easy was it for you when I said, finish the drawings? Uh, could you easily uh, start doing it? Or did you uh, get a little bit stuck and not know what to uh, draw? Uh, in my class, sometimes students, maybe they take sometimes 30 seconds, one minute, just to think of uh, what to draw. So that would be fluency of creative thinking. 
uh, can you easily jump into the creativity, a smooth creative thinker? Another category is flexibility. Uh, so for example, when I asked my students to tell the story of the picture, can they easily be flexible enough to do that? Um, or is the picture kind of uh, too abstract for them to connect a narrative uh, to what they have drawn? So creative, creative thinking uh, should also be flexible according to uh, Torrance. This is the big one we think of with creative thinking. This is originality. So for example, when I give this task to my students, quite often they draw the similar kinds of pictures. Uh, but if there's that one person, that one student who has something completely unique and it makes sense, uh, then you would say, oh, that's, uh, that's very original. That's very creative. Uh, so originality is a big part of it as well. And the last one here is elaboration. Uh, we know that expression, please elaborate, please give more details. That's what it is about here. Uh, can you easily add details with your creativity? So for example, uh, you were given the three minutes there when I was saying, hey, no, keep, keep drawing, add more details. Could you easily do that? When people were asking you questions about your drawing, who is it? Where is the person? All this stuff, can you easily give those details? Can you elaborate with your creativity? So let's take a look. Here are some examples from the internet. These are not from uh, my students, although some of them look similar to what my students have done uh, with this test. Uh, some of them definitely fall into the originality category, especially like this one. I never saw anybody do this except here. Uh, it looks like somebody with wings uh, flying too close to NORAD. I think NORAD is a, a military base uh, in America, maybe. Um, we can also see, see here this originality. A lot of people might say this is a hat. And if you did have space around your paper, maybe you draw outside the box. We think creativity is a thinking outside the box skill. Uh, so if uh, you draw outside the box, remember I didn't say uh, draw inside the box. I just said finish the drawings. It doesn't necessarily have to be inside the box. Um, in my experience, a lot of people uh, tend to draw animals, uh, maybe sharks, crocodiles, dinosaurs, fish, I think uh, is one here. We've got uh, down at the bottom there, uh, a cat and a dog. Uh, so you can see here uh, some of the drawings that uh, people come up with. So what are 21st century skills? We can say creativity is definitely considered one of them. Uh, we'll talk about why that is so in a moment. But what are 21st century skills? What do we mean by 21st century skills? That's what we need to know uh, before we cover them. A little bit of interaction now. I want you to use the Zoom chat and I want you to write any skill you think uh, belongs in the 21st century in the Zoom chat. So let me open the chat window. If you could just write in one idea for what you think is a 21st century skill. Uh, so don't worry about being wrong. What do you think is a 21st century skill? Problem solving is uh, very good. Ability to communicate, coding. Ability to cooperate, yeah. Intuition, okay, that kind of uh, inside skill. Uh, transferability of skills, that's definitely uh, covered, I think. Constant learning, maybe professional development, like uh, why we are here today. IT literacy, I like that one too. Empathy, yeah, we definitely need empathy if we want to be successful. So I like all of those ideas. Uh, let me sh give you a quick explanation now of 21st century skills. So if the volume is a little bit low on this, please uh, adjust, it's only a very short clip. This is from a video I made uh, last year where I covered 21st century skills, but I really want to show it to you today because uh, I think it really gives you a, an understanding of what we mean by 21st century skills. So like I said, if it's, a, if it's too loud or too quiet, please temporarily adjust the volume. Here we go. Go. The average worker was different. 
He, and it was usually a he, was likely to work in industry. The 20th century classroom was like a mock factory. Students were best served learning how to be punctual, follow instructions, and repeat mundane tasks without losing concentration. The 20th century worker stayed in one job for his entire life. It was rare for him to change careers. There were few examples of people entering the automobile industry to then work in marketing before moving on to write novels. Mobility was in the automobiles only. After the baby boom generation, the mind of the worker began to change. The criteria for a good job was no longer stability. Workers now wanted happiness and fulfillment in their work. As a result, when they don't like a particular job, they are likely to quit and work elsewhere. According to career change statistics, the average worker now changes careers five to seven times before retirement. By age 42, they may have already changed jobs 10 times. In the 21st century, it is no longer enough to teach one set of skills. Industrial jobs no longer dominate the work landscape, and people switch jobs like seats on a bus. The 21st century teacher must teach 21st century skills. These skills have been grouped into three main areas. Learning and innovation skills. This is the category that most teachers associate with 21st century skills. Critical thinking, creative thinking, communication, and collaboration make up the four C's that every teacher is expected to use in their lessons. Creative thinking is the ability to look at something from a new or different angle. Creative thinkers are not just artists and musicians, but people who can solve problems creatively. Anybody can develop creative thinking skills. Critical thinking is about logic, the ability to make rational decisions and judgments. Critical thinkers can sort fact from fiction and tell you why your idea will change the world or just stay on your brainstorm. Communication skills are a fundamental part of every modern worker's skill set. In the 21st century, people must communicate clearly with colleagues, management and potential customers. All styles of communication are needed, such as good listening skills, body language and public speaking. Collaboration skills are about teamwork. The mantra in the 21st century is that people work best when they work together. The days of the aloof factory or industrial technician are gone. If they can't play nice, they won't play at all, and they will find themselves looking for new employment. So yes, we saw that 21st century skills. Uh, so I've noticed a lot of uh, presentations will talk about what they are. What I want to do in the rest of this presentation is just give you lots of uh, ideas and examples of activities that have worked for me when I try to help students cover those 21st century skills. So this presentation is focused on the four C's. Uh, so let's start with the first one now, which is critical thinking. Uh, yes. Uh, so how can we teach critical thinking in the classroom? Let me show you some of my ideas. Um, the most obvious thing you can do is bring in big questions into your classroom, philosophical questions. Sometimes we think lower level English learners, well, let's just give them lower level questions all the time. Uh, what's your favorite animal? Uh, what will you eat for lunch? But I have tried giving big questions to uh, students of all levels, and I've been surprised how well it has worked. So I have even given this question before, for example, what is the meaning of life or uh, why is there a universe? What happens after we die? Those kinds of really big uh, questions. And even the lower level students uh, do seem to enjoy it. Uh, so that would definitely fall under critical thinking. Um, also, if you go onto Google and you type in, let's say, critical thinking dilemmas, critical thinking scenarios, there are a lot of different uh, scenarios, dilemmas, where you that you can give to students for them to give uh, their opinion. Um, often the dilemma doesn't have a correct 
outcome. Often there are pros and cons to uh, different solutions to the dilemma, uh, but it does give students that platform to explain why they would take that solution, why they would make that uh, decision. Uh, we won't do this uh, dilemma today, but this is a very famous dilemma, if you look later, called the Heinz Dilemma, you know, like baked beans, uh, Heinz Dilemma. Um, and it can work very well with students. So dilemmas uh, are really uh, good for critical thinking. We talked about big questions, but small questions also fall under critical thinking, uh, depending on how you ask it. So for example, who is your favorite musician? Who is your favorite singer? Why? That is critical thinking. It is a smaller question. It's not the meaning of life, but it is uh, a small question. Um, if you have particular students from, let's say, a science background or engineering like me, try to bring in questions that uh, connect to their major. So, for example, I might ask my engineering students, uh, who was the best inventor, Thomas Edison or Nikola Tesla? Uh, and then they would have to uh, rationalize why they would have that. Uh, I've also taught business students uh, what would be qualities of great leadership. Again, you can do this all this in English. Uh, but it is critical thinking. And then you can even have fun warm-up questions. I've done this one before. Uh, who would win in a fight, Batman, Superman, or Pikachu? Uh, my money would be on Pikachu, uh, so that would be good. And pictures. I've done this with very high-level students and lower-level students. I even did this with uh, students who are almost 100% uh, fluent um, in English, where you give them an image you put it on the projector or you can put it on paper and all you do is say, well, tell me what's going on. What does this, what does this image mean? What does it represent? What does it want you to think when you see this image? So you can see up here, you have this one with the, the doors there. There's a globe with people from different cultures. Uh, this one would be very tricky. Are they twins? Um, is it the same person look, looking in towards themselves? And uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs can be uh, really interesting to see what students think. So again, it's critical thinking, but uh, they do use their English uh, to uh, describe what is happening in each picture. You can do the same with videos. You can take movie clips, clips from TV shows, animations, whatever you want. Um, or you can find copyright free videos uh, like I had to do when I made a video course on this topic. Uh, so, for example, what would students think looking at this light bulb with construction workers around it? Or a video of a young lady uh, using a smartphone scrolling through social media? Or a, a video of a military entering a building? What kind of emotions do these videos want uh, to stir in you? What, what do they want you to think and feel? Uh, that's a question you can always pose to your students anytime you show uh, a video clip. Uh, debates uh, I've always, have always worked well for me in any class I've taught, and they seem to be popular. Uh, a big debate question, for example, in England, uh, should the voting age be lowered to age 16? Seems quite young, but there is a big push for that um, in the UK. Uh, so you can ask students to think, uh, are they pro or against that? Cats are better than dogs. Uh, do you have a strong opinion? Why? Why are they better? Why are they not better? Uh, our school should improve the lunch menu. Uh, anytime I give this topic to my university students, uh, talking about food, uh, they usually have some very strong opinions, not always positive opinions. Uh, you could even talk about countries. The US is the greatest country in the world. Do you agree or disagree? Again, if you wanted to, you could have students in groups. Some have to argue the proposition. Some have to argue against the proposition. Um, or you can just ask them to debate them amongst themselves. That would be completely up to you. Uh, there are also many games uh, that you can play. If you just type in Google again, critical thinking games, there are so many games that you can play. One we always did at my former university, Mike's University, Usong University, I don't know if they still do it now, was called the Egg Drop, uh, where you would put students in teams, give them sort of materials, and give each team an egg. And their goal, it was kind of task-based teaching, uh, they would have to drop the egg from a certain height, usually like a third floor or out the window, and they had to build an egg protector to stop the egg from breaking. Uh, so it was always interesting to see students 
uh, doing that, having to think critically about uh, their plans to protect the egg. Uh, journals have also worked well for me, and I know a number of teachers who use them in every class. So you give students a journal at the end of every class, maybe for five, 10 minutes, they have to do some self-reflection. What did I learn today? How can I improve for the next class? Uh, what do I need to do to get better? All those things they can write in their journal. I've done this with public speaking classes uh, where after each practice presentation, they would have to write uh, what, what they thought was good, what they thought was bad. That kind of self-reflection uh, is very good for critical thinking. And then there are also whole class activities. This one you'll you've probably done in your class already. Um, so for example, you put students in teams, you give them a list of items, maybe toilet paper, a gun, sunblock. Uh, by the way, not real items, only on paper you give these items. That would be quite difficult. An ax, a backpack. And of course, uh, you tell them they're on a boat, it is sinking, but there is a desert island. Voila, thank God. Uh, but what I've done is with each uh, group in the classroom, I give them a different scenario um, on the island. So you can have a lot of fun with that. For example, the island is calm and peaceful. Peaceful. You think you have arrived in paradise. Wait, what's that? It's windy. It's a tornado. It consumes everything in its path every 12 hours. Uh, so that's better than just saying, here's the item, survive on an island. Um, I've also done scenarios with zombies, mafia, dinosaurs. Um, can be a lot of fun if every group has a different scenario. So that was critical thinking. Now I want to share some ideas for creative thinking. Uh, so how can we teach uh, creative thinking in our class? Well, as an English teacher, I think really there's an unlimited amount of activities you can do. Uh, the ones that I like to do are, I call, create our activities. Uh, so for example, I've given the task of students creating uh, members of a K-pop group. So they would each create one member, then I put them in groups. They have to decide the name of the K-pop group, maybe write a song or at least present uh, the group. Uh, if you're teaching culinary students like uh, Mike is, or if you're just covering food in your textbook, of course, create a menu would be an obvious one. Uh, if you're covering vacations, why not create a vacation destination? Uh, they have to present on uh, why it would be a good place to visit, uh, what would be the population of the place, all those kinds of details. Um, when I've covered, let's say, uh, describing vocabulary inside your house or uh, navigating around a house, create a house, create their dream house. Uh, that can be a good, rather than just describe your house, describe your dream house. Uh, make it even bigger. I've taught architecture students, create a city like you would on that famous video game, Sim City. Uh, so I've had fun with that as well. Uh, also with students, when I've covered sports activities, hobbies, create a sports club for the university, make a poster, present it, try and persuade people to join the sport. Uh, also this one, I have also like to do create a character. Uh, I don't give them too many instructions on it, but just create a character and share the character with a group. Uh, so those are good. For example, maybe a zombie, and then they have to write the backstory. It's not just here's a zombie, but here's the backstory. Maybe it's a zombie who is uh, very lonely. He's missing his family. He's not trying to kill people. Uh, maybe if you're covering technology, create a new technology. Um, rather than just describe your smartphone or something they already have, describe something new that is not in existence. If it's geography, create a map, maybe a map to a treasure uh, on a treasure island, a map it to their dream house. Uh, of course, we all do this. Posters, but try to give them ideas of creating posters with messages. I think uh, that would be good as well. Okay, and uh, yes, also if you're thinking of technology, maybe they have to sell the technology. I've also have done this before. Um, you'll be surprised how adept students are now at making videos. 
Um, when I first tried it, I thought, oh, if I tell students to make a five minute video and they only have one hour, and uh, I thought, well, it's gonna be difficult. Maybe they don't know how to do it. I found uh, any class I've taught over the last few years, if I say, go, go outside the classroom for maybe 30 minutes, uh, make a particular kind of video and come back, all, uh, all the groups that I give it to, they always come back with very nice videos. So try to bring filming, video editing into your classroom. Uh, students are doing this all the time now with selfie videos. Talking to selfie videos, bring in social media, maybe get students to write a blog post or a Facebook post uh, that they can share with their classmates uh, that is connected to your class. So create art activities, uh, really, really good. Really good. Uh, we do this in writing classes. Uh, you can try this prompts where you just show an image on the screen and you ask students to just write what they think about this image, not necessarily critical thinking, like what, what, is, what is that? Why are we seeing this pineapple? But something creative um, regarding this pineapple. Uh, it could be feathers, could be any kind of item you want students to think about, maybe an alien. And again, if you Google just creative thinking activities, creative exercises, uh, I guarantee you will never run out. For example, uh, you'll know the famous one with the paper clips. Uh, you show students paper clip and you ask them in teams or groups to write down 100 uses of a paper clip. Uh, and I can tell you that is quite difficult. I've also done it where I say the team with the most users uh, would win uh, the activity there. Uh, so that can be very good. Uh, riddles, uh, I'm sure you've tried these. Uh, I think these require so, a degree of critical thinking, but also creative thinking. Uh, so for example, I saw without wings, uh, I see without eyes, I've traveled the universe to and fro, I've conquered the world, yet I've never been anywhere but home. Who am I? It's very difficult to answer this. It requires a lot of uh, inner thinking, 21st century skills. Uh, the answer for this one would be, Imagination. So you have to think a little bit creatively, a little bit more abstract than, oh, I'm a bird or something like that. Uh, also, there's many word games where students have to think creatively. So for example, this one, uh, let's say you give the students three words, uh, desert, ice, and spell, and you ask students to say, well, what is a word connected to all three of those words? And the words that I'd be looking for is dry, like desert is dry, dry ice, a dry spell. There are so many uh, word games for creative thinking that you can easily do with your students. Uh, we also have uh, mind maps. Uh, sometimes these get a little bit of criticism, especially if teachers do them all the time because uh, they could get quite boring for the students. Uh, but I use them occasionally because I just want to give students a question and I want them to think as many ideas as they can. So for example, let's say you're doing, who am I? Who are you? What, what are your ideas? Uh, now, let me show you another whole class activity that I do uh, to really help my students develop critical thinking and creative thinking. Uh, this one is based on a course I taught almost 10 years ago now um, in the summer and winters, uh, really almost a creative thinking course uh, using a book called Widgets, which you might know. Uh, so I would give students, this is how I do it now because I've developed and I use it in my own way. Uh, I give students this piece of paper, watch the infomercials, what are the problems and solutions? So there, if you go on YouTube, there are many infomercials, some of them are very funny. And uh, you ask students to write the name of the product, what is the problem in the infomercial and what is the solution that the product offers? Uh, so let me show you an example. Again, adjust your volume if it's too high or too low. Are you tired of peel, peel, peeling potatoes? Stop! Introducing Handy Peel, the quick and easy way to prepare a meal. Pick a raw potato, hold under the water, then just rub, peel, and scrub all at the same time for a pile of perfectly peeled potatoes. It's that easy. The secret is the Handy Peel's molded rubbing nubs that grip and cleanly peel the skin. Old-fashioned peeling is hard and wasteful. With Handy Peel, you just rub, peel, and scrub. Just look at the difference. 
There we go. Uh, Handy Peel, I can tell you of the infomercials I show my students, Handy Peel is the most popular. And I guarantee if I had the Handy Peel, let's say 10 of them in the classroom, I think all 10 of them would be sold uh, very quickly. It's a very popular uh, product for some reason. Uh, so after I show the infomercials, then I give students the activity of thinking of some of their own problems in their daily life as students. So for example, it could be, I don't know, being late to class, forgetting to do homework, falling asleep during some lectures. So I asked them to think about those problems. And then of course, to connect it to creative thinking, I asked them to design new inventions to solve three of the problems. Um, again, when we talked about creative thinking fluency, this is sometimes you have to just as a teacher grin and bear it because you might get a two or three minutes where a student is kind of staring at this paper thinking, I don't know any ideas for new inventions. And you just encourage them. And every time I've done this with a lot of students, once I encourage them and I say, no, no, just take your time, the ideas will come. Always I start seeing free ideas for new inventions, uh, which for me proves that every student can be creative. It's just a muscle, you just have to practice. Uh, after they design their, uh, they think about free new inventions, of course, I want to put them in groups. Uh, so I put them in groups and I tell them, choose one invention among all your ideas uh, and prepare a presentation. I want you to sell this invention uh, to the class. So you can, usually I give them poster paper actually, and then they can uh, put a sketch of the invention on the paper. And I also ask them to prepare notes for a script. Uh, just a hint, I give all students a piece of paper and I tell all of them they have to write the script. Uh, it prevents students from kind of sitting uh, idly, not doing anything. Um, and then of course they present. And uh, I think that's one of the best things about creative uh, thinking is you present your ideas uh, and see the feedback, see the reaction. So for example, this was, I guess, a couple of years ago when I was still in face-to-face -face classrooms, um, computer alarm, let's do homework. And you can see they remember the problem solution part of it. Uh, there are a lot of times when I put off doing my homework or forget about it, use a computer alarm, price $1.99. I do cover some basic marketing strategies like the 99, for example, compulsorystudy.com, you have to study. I think this is supposed to be, oh my God, but uh, the task wasn't perfect spelling. Uh, oh my God, kimchi. Um, it is free, $10 for no ads. So ah, they, they picked this up from social media, I guess. Uh, so yeah, that was a good one. Uh, Sue Kite Market, that was the na a nickname of a student in the class that she chose. Uh, $10,000, not cheap, but it is the time stop remote control. Uh, for $10,000, I think that would be very popular, but there are only 200 limited editions. And uh, a makeup face mask, only uh, two plus one, only $5. Um, from what I remember, students said if they put this on their face, um, makeup would be applied automatically or removed automatically. I can't remember which one, uh, but it would be, make life a lot more convenient. Uh, now, just some ideas for communication skills in our class. This should be the easiest one because we teach communication. We are English teachers, uh, but you do teach all four skills in communication, which should be reading, writing, speaking. Actually, that's a clip from my video course on this topic and uh, listening. So I think a lot of the skills we cover uh, quite in-depth speaking should be the most obvious one writing a little bit, especially if you're teaching writing, uh, reading, not every teacher, I guess, but um, they do have a lot of exposure to that. But I think it's the listening, a uh, particular kind of listening that they need more practice in. And the, the listening that they need to practice is active listening, not toic listening, although you do have to be active to get a good score, I guess, uh, but how to concentrate on what people are saying, or at least get the gist or the main idea. I also teach uh, in face-to-face -face classes, uh, listening with your body. So you usually mirror people's body language uh, when you are listening to them. It shows that you're really paying attention and you are connected with a person. Smiling um, also usually looks good in communication. Eye contact shows you are listening, of course. Posture I also cover with my students. 
uh, like leaning in closer to people to show that you're really uh, paying attention. So those skills we should be teaching. Um, a whole class activity for communication skills. Uh, one thing I should mention here is, although um, it's 21st century skills, these skills don't exist kind of separately or in a vacuum. So you'll find that almost any activity you do, uh, I think if it's, a, if it's a good activity, probably has critical thinking, creative thinking, communication, and as we'll see, collaboration. Uh, this one, as I mentioned earlier, I like students to create characters. So this is a whole class character uh, activity I occasionally do. This is the paper I give students to think about a new character. Uh, so I tell them, think of a, a character's name, any character. It doesn't have, I don't tell them it has to be a person, it can be anything. DOB, they don't know the meaning of. So I teach them, of course, that's date of birth and the backstory. And I usually flash up um, a model example because as I've done this with very low level students. I've actually done this with level zero students and uh, modeling examples is always a very good idea. Uh, so, for example, here we have Potato Man, date of birth, January 2nd, 1982, uh, bio, this is Potato Man. He was born in New York when he was 12 years old. He had an accident, just like many superheroes. Um, he accidentally fell into a bag of potatoes. Uh, when he woke up, he looked like a potato. Now he has some amazing superpowers. He can sit still for a very long time and make delicious french fries. I wish I could do that. Uh, now I remember actually, uh, not just a character, I actually uh, often ask students to create superheroes. Uh, so that was uh, a good way to do it. Of course, after they've created their characters, that's not enough, that's not a whole class activity. Um, I put students in uh, groups and I ask them to think of a story. And rather than just you know a novel that they'd be reading out, um, I want them to perform the story with their characters to the class. So even with my level zero students, I flash up an example of uh, a script from a movie. Uh, I've sometimes used this part from The Matrix and I just go over, well, how do you describe a scene in a movie? Um, well, how do you write the character names? Uh, so very rudimentary stuff, um, not really advanced. And even the level zero students picked it up very, very quickly. Uh, after that, of course, in their groups, they have to think about a script. Uh, I give them the paper for the script. Um, if it's superheroes, this is the one I give. Um, and I usually connect it to the objective for that week in the textbook. So for example, write a script for your superheroes. They must introduce themselves, talk about their hobbies, talk about their likes and dislikes, and of course, save the world. Uh, this was actually my level zero class, so that's the reason here I was focusing on the basics of what they had been learning. Uh, hobbies, likes and dislikes, how to introduce themselves. And then this is the piece of paper I would give every group. And like I said earlier, I would give every student um, a piece of paper so that it's not just one student doing all the writing. Uh, every student does need the script. How can they um, practice together? Uh, or perform if they use the script, if they don't all have a copy. Uh, and I always give a quick example of my, my own to show them how to do the script. So for example, in the description part, place, Spud School of Science time night, it was dark and quiet. Nobody was at Spud School of Science except Potato Man. Suddenly there is a loud bang and Bird Woman flies down from the sky. Potato Man, hey, what's up? Who are you, Bird Woman? My name is Bird Woman. I come from the land of bird people. I have the amazing superpower to fly. Potato Man. Wow, that's awesome. I am Potato Man. I have the amazing superpower to... I look like a potato. Uh, so yeah, I tried to show an amusing example if I can. Uh, and that worked uh, very well with all my classes, uh, even at level zero. Now there's one more we have a little bit of time to cover, which is collaboration. Uh, which is about teamwork. I always tell my students it's about, think about the Avengers, uh, Iron Man, um, whoever, Wonder Woman are very good by themselves individually, but to solve the biggest problems, they have to come together, they have to collaborate. That's how I view it. First thing I should say uh, when I do it, you need a collaborative layout in your classroom. So I would always spend five minutes walking into my face-to-face -face classes, changing the layout of the class. Uh, always I would walk in the classroom, it was in rows. I'm sure you do the same or many teachers will get students to do it. I change the layout 
to facilitate collaboration. Um, I've had a lot of success putting the tables together into groups of four. And I've also found students build a lot of close rapport, a lot of close, friends close friendships when they are in groups of four, uh, almost like they are the Avengers in their groups. Freeze I've done very well, depending on your class size and what you want to accomplish. I've done freeze with the script writing activity and uh, always has been uh, no problem, but much better than just having them by themselves. Uh, this one, um, I've not always been a fan of, I, to be honest, because sometimes I felt like it feels like I'm on stage, like I'm the center of attention, it's all about me. Uh, but um, I have been in classrooms where I have used the horseshoe and it worked really well. Students were engaged when I wanted to do group work and pair work, they could talk next to each other or I would tell, let's say this student, you know, go around and move over here into this group, bring your chair. Uh, so the horseshoe um, can work very well as well. Um, pretty much any setup except the uh, rows. Participation systems, sometimes there's a little bit of criticism of participation systems, especially at the university level. Uh, like, why, why are we telling students what to do? They are, they are adults. Uh, I have always disagreed with that because I think um, even though they're adults, if they were working in an office, they still wouldn't be able to do anything they want. They have to get used to that. Uh, but I do like to reward students for collaboration, for participating in class. But this is the one I would use with children 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago in the hog one, names on the board and stars. I don't use that with university students. I know teachers who hand out cards to their students and uh, they can keep track of their participation every class. I'm sure that would encourage students to always participate, always collaborate um, if they know they're going to water. This is actually the one I use in face-to-face -face classes. Um, I don't put this on the screen. I don't really show students this, but I do walk around the classroom uh, carrying this kind of uh, sheet in my hands. By the way, these are not real students. Uh, don't worry, it's confidential. Um, at my former university, we had to get signatures for attendance. Uh, so I would always get them to sign uh, here their names when they walked in. They would always see here there's a participation column and they would get five points for good participation. Um, what I would do is if students were doing good work, collaborating, let's say they're writing the scripts, they're all together, then I would say, oh, good work, you're getting two points. And I would show them that I'm writing it on my clipboard, on my paper. Um, if they weren't participating, um, thankfully very rare, but if they weren't, then I would say, I'm going to have to take away points or something like that. You know, it's part of their grade, so it's, it's very good to be upfront about it if you want that collaboration. Team games, uh, Pictionary, for example, bingo, there's so many team games that you can do to get students collaborating. Uh, this one is uh, one, uh, I think it has different names. I call it Hotspot, because that's what I was told it was called, uh, where you get a student standing away from the, or sitting away from the whiteboard, and you or another student writes the vocabulary behind them, and the rest of the class has to describe the word without saying the word, and that student has to uh, guess the word. So again, it just creates a whole class atmosphere of collaboration. Uh, another one I've done with university students, I don't go to a real pub, but I do it in the classroom, imaginary of course, uh, team quizzes or pub quizzes as I like to call them, and uh, we cover lots of different areas, not just what's in the textbook, so maybe science questions in English, geography questions uh, are also very good. They, they enjoy that. They know a lot about the world. Sports, there's always students who like sports. Uh, music or animals. And I run it like a real pub quiz in England. No beer, because I, I don't want to get fired. Uh, but I do um, have teams and they get points and uh, they feel a lot of satisfaction winning. There's also many tasks you can give uh, to get students collaborating, like task-based teaching, getting groups working on travel itineraries if you're covering travel. I've had students plan parties, not real parties, but uh, fancy ones. I've even had them kind of uh, role play the party after they have planned it. And of course, uh, the old classic one kind of um, asking for directions, getting students walking around uh, the classroom. Whole class activity, I've done this. Uh, I get students uh, first just to think about what did they see in the news, current events. Uh, so they use their smartphones to look at different news stories. And then I tell them, actually, I'm going to ask them in groups to present uh, stories as news reporters. 
uh, and it will be kind of a breaking news announcement live to the class in their groups. So it's a live presentation of a breaking news story. And of course, I give them time in their groups to prepare to research that story and think about who will do each role, who's the reporter. Uh, maybe somebody is kind of on, on location, they're there live uh, where the story is happening. Uh, have I enjoyed that one. And so, yeah, we, they present it. Uh, I don't film them, but I think that would work. Uh, one quick tip I'll give you here is, you can see different stories there. Um, just to make it a little bit more exciting, you might know the random name picker when they are going to uh, present their story rather than say, your turn, your turn. I put it on the screen, I spin the wheel and it is their turn. And of course the students who are watching, uh, they will be asking questions so they're not just passively uh, watching. So these were 21st century skills. I hope I've given you enough ideas, uh, maybe some new ones. So thank you very much uh, in English, Korean and Japanese. Uh, so of course, as you know, I'm Wayne Finley. If you wanna get in touch for any reason, maybe some ideas, some materials, you can reach out to me uh, by email or my preference for networking is LinkedIn. It's where I am most active. So you can easily type my name. You should find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so thank you very much. I really enjoyed giving this uh, session today. And I'm gonna hand you back over to Mike now because I believe Mike has an important video uh, to show you.